there are times when I wish I had some answers. Answers about scripture and what it means. Answers about what Jesus really meant when he said whatever it was that he said. Answers about the best way to interpret these words from so long ago in a way that is relevant for us today. Answers about the questions that will undoubtedly come up as we begin to study this text that's in front of us today, and quite frankly, the rest of the Sermon on the Mount. There's a lot here today, and many of it will have to go untouched. I continue to run into questions being asked in a way that demands a tight, specific, timeless answer. And there are a few of these types of questions that can be answered in such a way. The texts that stand in front of us today would fall into that category for me. When people read these texts, it is easy to gravitate to the easy. Don't murder. Okay. Work out your differences. Okay. If you are headed to court, settle on the way. Okay. Don't commit adultery. Okay. Keep your hearts and your thoughts clean. Okay. If part of you sins, cut it off, toss it away. Okay. If you divorce your wife, give her a certificate of divorce. You can do that. If you divorce, don't remarry. Okay. Don't swear falsely. Okay. Keep your vows to the Lord. Okay. We're all good. We have our rules for living in all of these areas of life. So now we can all go home. From where I sit as a pastor, creating that list was way too easy of a read of scripture and answers that came all too easy. If we're searching for the easy answers to the questions of life that come our way, then we're really not living the Sermon on the Mount. We like to paint Jesus as always having everything that was needed at whatever time it was needed. He always had the clarifying answer he always kept his calm. He always welcomed everyone from the first time he met them. He always had the right word at the right time that set a person's heart straight. And he always encouraged his disciples to stay in any situation until the very end, except when he didn't. In this passage for today, he expanded the law and he caused confusion. In the temple, he overturned the tables, and he got out a whip. Walking through a foreign place, his response made a woman ask him for what is usually given to the dogs, and could that be given to her? His words to the rich young ruler sent the man away from him. And as he was instructing his disciples to go out to various communities and to share the good news, he instructed them to offer peace to all whom they met. And if they were met with peace in return, they should stay. And if they were not met with peace, then they should dust off their sandals and keep going to another place where they might find peace. If we're really reading the stories of Jesus, if we are really, will, really willing to see all of the parts of Jesus and his interactions with this world, then we have to be willing to see the ugly. We have to see the difficult, and to see what Jesus, that even Jesus didn't always do what we might have expected him to do in his many interactions with people. I have found that mostly we like to look away from those kinds of scriptures. They're difficult. They can be unsettling. They show us what we all know, that the earth is full of humans, fallen, broken, and in need of things being set right by God who's really the only one who can set things right. Jesus was the living embodiment of God setting things right, even if it looks upside down to us, which is right where it lands us in the part of the Sermon on the Mount that we're looking at today. How I would love to be able to take current situations and lay them into the text and just see Jesus' answers appear, I think would make things a lot easier. When I read, do not commit murder, do not harbor anger toward a brother or sister, or insult a brother or sister, I say, amen. That is the way that we should live, because finally, harm to one another will come to an end if we watch our relationships. But then I read the statistics about women who are in abusive relationships. 
I read that in the majority of those homes, the, the man will have access to firearms. I read that in the majority of those homes, when firearms are present, that the woman will most likely end up dead, murdered. I read that when a man commits the murder in those situations, he can expect limited jail time. I read that when it is the woman who commits the murder in those situations, she can expect a life sentence. And I wonder, what do we do with that? What is the easy answer when a person has reached a level of desperation that we don't even want to look at? What is the question that comes back to the church? Are we ready to walk into the places when people, with people before they get to the point of that kind of desperation? What about when we have a conflict with our brother or sister? What if we have tried repeatedly to set things right, and yet nothing seems to satisfy or appease the person who feels that they have been wronged? What if the issue, the level of hurt and harm, is so deep that resolution on this side of heaven is impossible? What is the question that comes back to the church? Are we ready to walk into the places with people when reconciliation cannot be found or achieved? What if someone gets among us gets a divorce or commits adultery? I want to handle this one with great care as I am aware that there are persons in this congregation for whom divorce and or adultery is a reality, either in their own lives or in their families or among their friends. It's a touchy subject, and honestly, I don't always like to touch it. It's painful no matter how you approach it, and I think that's a good thing to keep in mind. A very wise woman has said to me, divorce is painful. We should always remember that in it there is a tearing apart of lives joined, no matter what the circumstances were surrounding that ending. There was a situation where a husband lived for many years with a wife who continually cheated on him until he decided for his health and the health of his family that he had to file for divorce. It was painful. Years later, he met a woman who was faithful and loving and kind, and he was faced with a decision. Should he not remarry and enjoy a healthy marriage? What is the question that comes back to the church? Are we ready to walk into the places with people when brokenness happens? As a little child, when I heard the passage about taking out your eye or cutting off your hand because it had caused you to sin, and hearing sermons about any appendage that causes you sin needs to be cut off. Now, I was a child, remember, and while I am sure that there was more to the sermon than just that, it was too late for me. I was already imagining a world where everyone was walking around with some sort of body part missing because that person had sinned. It might feel a little too close to home to each of us when we realize that it is likely that not one part of our body would be free from the stipulation if we took this text seriously and literally. I don't know of anyone who has not sinned at some point in their lives. What is the question that comes back to the church? Are we ready to walk into those places with people who sin? What about people who say yes and really mean no? What about the people who say no but really mean yes? What about the people who do not keep their promises to us? What about the people who do not keep the vows that they made to God? How do we qualify that? How do we even know? Can we even know? What is the question that comes back to the church? Are we ready to walk into the places with people and live in the mystery of life with them? You have heard it was said, but I say to you, it is easy to see this, is a, this as a reframing of the words of the Old Testament. It was genius on the part of Jesus, really. If we read the statements that he made and reference it back to the Old Testament, we see that he is offering this fuller explanation of the teachings. I enjoy studying these New Testament texts with two books that Michelle Hirschberger recommended to me a couple of years ago by David Stern. Jewish New Testament and Jewish New Testament Commentary. They're written by a Messianic Jew, 
a Jew who honors Jesus as the Messiah of Israel. In his commentary, he reminds the Christians that we often misunderstand the definition of Torah. Torah means teaching in Hebrew. We usually interpret it to mean law. Torah can also mean the first five books of the Bible, and it can also include all the prophets and the writings of the Old Testament, and the oral, the oral Torah as it was given, and the writings of the rabbis throughout the ages that is considered interpretations and guides to living. This whole thing can be called Torah. Right after this section of Scripture, Jesus is saying, right before this section of Scripture, Jesus is saying that he did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. To use Stern's language, Jesus is saying he did not come to abolish the teachings, but to fulfill the teachings. To call us to live more fully within the teachings and how they influence our lives. What I found most fascinating about his commentary was when he was speaking of the reasons Jesus started this section with a reference to what we know as the Ten Commandments. In the Jewish faith, he references them as ten sayings. He notes that in the Jewish tradition, the starting point in the section is, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. I am the Lord your God, that tells us who God is who brought you out of the land of Egypt. This tells us of the involvement of God in our ongoing lives. Out of the house of bondage, God's concern for, the, for, their, for their welfare, and ours too. If anyone here has had Biblet with Michelle, John, or Marion, this is not news to you. That line comes before every one of the other sayings, always putting the teaching into the context of who God is, how God will be involved, and God's concern for people's welfare. What goes along with this commentary is the interpretation that because of these three things, describing what God has done, is doing, and will do on our behalf, that in faith, hope, love, and gratitude, his people should obey him. It is what we as Christians aspire to. It is what we do when we strive to follow Jesus with all of our lives. It shapes our living, it fills our life, and it is certainly not easy. It never will be. We will get dirty, it will be a mess, because that's the way of the cross. So what does all of this mean for our living today? I've been alluding to this all during the sermon by asking this question. What is the question that comes back to the church? In each of these different situations, not just the one I mentioned today, but the ones that we encounter in all of life, and offering this invitation, are we ready to walk into the places with people and, and you can fill in the blank. You might be wondering, how does this look? Can you give me a checklist? No, I cannot. It's not easy. It's not that easy just to write it down and give you steps. But here's an idea of where to start on the journey. Be attentive. To the Spirit first and then to each other and to what is happening around us. I can't tell you what the Spirit is going to tell you. You have to discover that on your own. We all have to discover that on our own. We all need to ask the Holy Spirit for guidance and cultivate discernment practices and then be ready to engage and enact that discernment even if it's not what we thought it might be. Study the scripture together so that we can learn with one another over the scripture and see how that study shapes, our, shapes and guides our life. We need to hear from one another about the scripture that we are reading and what it means to us and what we are finding there. It's how the Anabaptists have interpreted scripture for years together in community. We don't do this alone. We turn to one another. We have all walked so very different roads with some very different, different life situations and with some very different outcomes. We might be surprised what we learn from one another when we start listening to one another. It makes a difference when we listen. We take all of these things and begin walking the path with others. What is the question that comes back to the church? Maybe it's time for us to start asking.